Okay, so today we're going to talk about sea level. Sea level is composed of a bunch of different effects. Um, it's a little bit confusing because the sea level is normally broken down into things that contribute to global mean sea level and things that are uh, contribute to relative sea level or regional sea level, which are uh, changes relative to a particular point on the earth. Um, those two pieces are distinct. From a global perspective, sea level is composed of the thermal expansion of seawater. That is, you change the temperature of the seawater and it changes the density of the seawater, so it expands. Um, so see if, since it's in the base, the same size basin, it goes higher. Um, there's also a contribution to uh, global sea level from land ice, or which could be glaciers or ice sheets. Um, if they melt and they are presently supported on land, then that water ends up in the ocean, then that ends up increasing the volume of the ocean as well. Um, and then the last piece is hydrology and land water changes, which basically has to do with precipitation and ponds and lakes and all that stuff. If the, that water ends up, rather than being on uh, gravitationally supported on land, ends up in the oceans, then it ends up contributing to the global mean sea level. On a regional basis, the changes in the solid earth, um, changes in the gravity from place to place, changes in rotation rate of the earth, changes in the deformation, that is the shape of the basins can make a big difference. Um, part of that is the continuing response of the earth to the removal of glaciers from the, from the uh, ice ages. And so that's a slow process, which has a kind of predictable contribution. And then there's vertical land motion, which has to do with things like subsidence and changes to the water and aquifers and sedimentation and all kinds of things like that um, can end up in the vertical land motion piece. There's also ocean dynamics. So all of the stuff that we've been talking about, about sea surface height being in geostrophic balance with currents, that's all goes in the dynamics category. Um, and that also leads to important regional changes. It doesn't change the total volume of the water, but it changes where it is. And then the last piece is uh, waves, tides, and storms. Those kind of things also don't change the total volume, but can make a big impact on uh, storm surges, tides, waves can make a big impact on when the sea level rises enough that it actually has an impact, even though um, it's not a not a sea level change in the sense that we're normally thinking of in terms of large scale effects. So here's an example of a storm surge in Providence, um, which this is up to the 38 hurricane. There's this is downtown Providence, and you can see that there was quite a bit of storm surge, um, probably also a substantial amount of tide involved in this particular image not so much of a climate change sea level rise likely um, in this case. The sea level rise before uh, the 1970s was not very much in comparison to what's happened since then. So global mean sea level has risen by 19 uh, centimeters over the period from 1901 to 2010, calculating using the mean rate over those 110 years based on time gauge records and since 1993, using satellite data. It is very likely, and that an IPCC speak means 95% window, um, sorry, 90, from five to 95%, um, the fifth percentile being um, 1.5, the 95th percentile being 1.9 millimeters per year. Um, so it's 1.7 between 1901 and 2010, and it has increased to 3.2 uh, millimeters per year between 93 and 2010. So. Sea level has been rising over the whole of the 20th century and up to present. The recent rates of the past two decades are about double what they were in the previous uh, uh, 110 years, or the, the previous part of that interval um, over the whole 110 years. Other pieces from the IPCC AR5, and I should say this is the fifth assessment report, not the one that I worked on. I've been working on, but the one before it from now uh, that was released in 2013. Um, it's very likely that warming the upper ocean in the upper 700 meters of the ocean has been contributing about 0.6 millimeters per year of sea level rise. This is largely from in situ observations. Um, not so much Argo, because the Argo hadn't been running for very long for the AR5, but for AR6. As you can imagine, Argo is a big part of the upper 700 meters, but there's a bunch of other. Uh, bathythermographs and upper ocean measurements from lots of uh, ship cruises that contribute to this number. 
Um, so that's about half, roughly, of the uh, you know, a little less than half of of the of what the contribution over since seventy one. Um, it's likely that the rate of sea level rise increased from the early 19th century to the 20th century um, and increased further over the 20th century. So we just saw, talked about those rates accelerating toward the latter end of the 1901 to 2010 window. I mean, it's likely that the magnitude of extreme high sea level events has increased since 1970. So all of these pieces are kind of getting at those impacts of waves and other pieces. Uh, and the contributors to sea level. So one of the complicated things about doing sea level is that you're looking at very old instruments and trying to bring them into a calibrated modern calculation. Um, that's one thing that's hard. But another thing that's hard is that there's vertical land motion just where the uh, where the different instruments sit. Some places are subsiding, some places are going up. So this is a comparison of different locations on the east and west side of different parts of the ocean across different basins. And you can see that there's pretty substantial variability between one side and the other. Um, this is in millimeters of, of uh, mean sea level anomaly. Um, this has actually already been corrected for the glacial isostatic adjustment. Um, but it's but it's got a bunch of this vertical land motion stuff left in it um, from the, the these tide gauges, the location of the tide gauges going up and down. Um, it also has a bunch of ocean dynamics in it, um, as you would imagine, as we know from the very clinic transport across a particular location, or sorry, very tropic transport between. Uh, of geostrophic transport between different locations would have some variability in it. And that variability is going to uh, impact on the east to west uh, um, or north to south uh, sea level estimates. So there are lots of pieces to this story. Um, there is the changes in the groundwater, changes in the surface water. That's the hydrological cycle part. There are changes in glaciers and mountains. There are changes in ice sheets and ice shelves. And so the ice shelves, if they are not grounded, don't actually contribute to sea level on their own. They're already floating. So melting an ice shelf or releasing an iceberg does not actually change sea level if it's not grounded. That is, if it's not, its weight was not supported by the ground rather than the ocean. But what it can do is it can remove the buttressing, as it's called, for the ice sheets behind. So once you remove the ice shelves, it's the next thing to melt might actually be something that's grounded. Um, atmosphere ocean interaction has a lot to do with sea level, both from the dynamics perspective, but also from the exchange of energy um, and the thermal effects, the halon effects um, of the ocean changes in density do have consequences for both global and regional sea level. Um, yeah. So this is one way of thinking about how the processes contributing to different estimates of sea level come down. There are three different color schemes here that all add up. So let's look first at the red bars. There are three red bars. And the three red bars tell you that the geocentric sea level change plus the vertical land motion gives you the relative sea level change. OK, that's interesting. So geocentric is a coordinate system based on the center of the Earth. The vertical land motion is this uh, regional uh, geological variability having to do with subsidence and uplift. And so the relative sea level change, the sea level change moving up and down relative to a particular place on Earth um, is the combination of those two effects. Relative sea level change also appears in the green circuit, which has um, the inverse barometer effect, which is like atmospheric pressure variations affecting sea level. The uh, GRD, so that's the rotation, gravity, and dis display and, dis uh, and uh, deformation. That's the solid earth changes. The very static sea level rise, which is the sea level rise on a fixed pressure surface, those 
four together add up to the stereodynamic sea level change, um, which is similar to what is calculated um, in a lot of ocean models. The blue set of bars is the ocean dynamic sea level change minus the global mean thermostatic sea level rise gives you the stereodynamic sea level change in a different manner. So these are the these pieces of the story go together in a different way. Um, okay. So ocean dynamic, global mean thermostatic, stereodynamic. Great. Now let's see which one have we not done yet. Have we done? We have not done the orange one. So ocean dynamic also could be broken up into the changes in the geoid, plus the geocentric sea level change, plus the inverse barometer effect. Or finally, we can get to the black lines, which talk about change in geoid height minus the global mean sea level rise, which adds up to with the thermostatic plus the halosteric plus the manometric that's adding uh, more and the, the steric sea level change. So there are a variety of different ways of pulling this story apart. Okay. Good. This is a great paper by uh, Jonathan Gregory and others in 2019 that try and, and clarify a bunch of these different complicated words and how they're all hooked together. Um, the important point here is that there are closed budgets for different definitions of sea level rise. Um, and so you, by taking advantage of those closed budgets, you may be able to estimate one term that's missing from the other terms that are not missing. So all of these pieces are kind of like dominated by the physical balances, but different physics constrain different combinations of terms, which is uh, quite difficult to think about in some, <laughs> in some complex way. But uh, nonetheless, it is worth doing because if you have a closed budget for you know, all the green terms here, then you can add all the green terms up and know that you're gonna end up to zero. So you might not be able to estimate one of them, but you can estimate the others in that closed budget. And then the closure of the budget gives you that term. Okay, so the best studied aspect of uh, probably the best studied is the physics of thermal expansion. So density increase, decreases with temperature. Um, as temperature increases, so the sea level will rise if a fixed mass of water is warmed in a fixed basin. So let's think about how we get that estimate. Well, we've talked a little bit about air sea fluxes and we've talked a little bit about warming of the ocean. Um, what we're really thinking about here is sort of the whole climate system budget of energy. Um, and most of the energy that comes into the climate system from the sun might either be reflected as reflected short wave or uh, re-emitted back as outgoing long wave radiation. The coming out of the ocean, it can be pinging back and forth and what are called upwelling and downwelling long wave radiation. These exchanges between the atmosphere and the ocean within the upper ocean atmosphere budget. Um, and then there is also the exchange of energy with deeper ocean um, up and in, into and out of the mixed layer. This little budget is focused on the mixed layer, but we could have chosen any vertical section. We could have used the whole ocean. We could have used just the upper 2000 meters, the upper 700 meters, the upper 200 meters. All of those budgets are pieces of this story that frequently get used. Um, the hydrographic observations show, um, so hydrographic observations show that ocean heat content is not fixed. And in fact, the flux is not zero at the bottom, but we can still make pronouncements about the total amount of energy versus the overall, uh, versus the changes in the Earth system. So 20% of the anthropogenic forcing equals the warming of the oceans and about 70% of it goes back to space. So that, that we, the anthropogenic change is warming the surface, but a lot of that is making its way back out. Um, but 90% of the warming that stays in the system stays in the oceans or over 90%. This is two different estimates. Um, one is using the Argo floats and one is using traditional hydrography. They differ within error bars. 
So it's not clear whether this is because of variability in the oceans um, and you know decade to decade changes or whether it's from the improved uh, uh, there's also some you could be concerned about whether the instruments are all the same. Um, but the important takeaway message here is that the vast majority of this warming is happening in the ocean um, compared to the amount of warming of land or amount of energy that's represented by the warming of land, warming of the atmosphere, warming of ice. So um, and the warming of other water. Um, so basically, the whole story of where the energy budget of the Earth, what the reservoir of the energy budget is, changes in the ocean. And you could break this down in various ways. You could break it down into the abyssal ocean, the southern ocean, the deep water, the surface water, as you like. Um, this is one set of choices here. Um, so here's a different breakdown where it's just upper deep and then uh, land and ice. And you see a similar story where basically the whole of the energy budget change is happening in the ocean. The upper ocean is uh, the light blue, the deep ocean is the dark blue. And that's pretty much uh, the whole change. This is in zeta joules, which is 10 to the 21st joules um, of energy um, over this, this window of time. Um, how do we know ocean heat content and energy change? Well, we know it because of either the uh, releasing of, of ships. Um, this is the uh, go ship repeat section. So we need to go back and measure the same location more than once to get the changes in ocean heat content. You may have been concerned by the fact that there is no real meaning to ocean heat content in the overall sense. What does zero ocean heat content mean? So it's really, we're always talking about ocean heat content anomalies from one time to another time um, when we're talking about this kind of chain expansion in energy. So we really need repeat transects. We can't just go and measure the temperature once and know the ocean heat content in an absolute sense. There is no absolute version of what the ocean heat content is, but we can measure more than once and see the change in energy over a particular window in time. That's why you might have wondered what was happening with everything going to zero at the beginning of this interval. That's just a convention when they chose. Um, this little movie here is showing you um, how Argo floats work. Um, and um, They get thrown off uh, of something like a boat and then they do profiling on their own. I think we've already watched this video before, so I'm not gonna run it the whole time. They're a mess of them. They're about 4,000 or so, between 3,500 and 4,000 um, all over the world. They do a great job of sampling um, repeatedly over and over and over again on a relatively uniform way all around the world. Um, what a ship-based um, sampler looks something like this. So it, all these tubes around the outside are called Niskin bottles. Those are for sampling water masses, um, not sampling things that you can not necessarily temperature and salinity, which isn't very well preserved in these kind of bottles, even though they are insulated. Um, instead, the CTD is hiding somewhere in the middle of this, and I don't think we can see it, but um, what happens is that the temperature and salinity are measured by the CTD and pressure as well. Um, and then as you descend, you actually can um, close the Niskin bottles at, when you hit a particular depth and get a water sample of that depth. Niskin bottles are open at both the top and the bottom. So um, the water is flowing through easily until you close the tops. And let's just go a little bit more until we see one of the tops close. Uh, see, they're still at the surface. They haven't even started to dive yet. Okay, now they may be going down. Okay, now they're, now they're releasing. And so the ship, while this is all going on, has to stay stationary, which is why this method of uh, sampling is very expensive, is because it takes a lot and a lot, a lot of ships to cover the ocean. Whereas the Argo floats, by contrast, individually are relatively inexpensive and they live for you know a year or more. And so they're taking profiles about well, once a week for a year. That's a lot of data. So even though each one of those profiles is not what a ship could do, um, they are at least, uh, oh, there we go. Now the bottles have started closing. There you go, see, closing. And they're closing on both the top and the bottom at the same time. All right. 
let's move it to the next slide. So what we get from this kind of uh, assessment is we get um, global measurements of ocean heat content. So here are some comparisons, but because the sampling is so sparse and because there's so much variability, you know, are you in an eddy, are you not in an eddy? What about El Nino, all that kind of thing. Um, it matters pretty sensitively, or at least it did up until the recent past, um, the post Argo era, um, how you statistically analyzed all of the different places. So this upper figure and this fig panel A is showing uh, a comparison between uh, five different estimates of what the ocean heat content is. Um, these more recent data up here are showing uh, the collapse of them after we've gotten um, into the Argo era, and they're all tending to agree in the more modern record. Um, if you go deep, um, so this is just deep here, so this is, is it 700, 2000 meter, 2000 to 6000 meter, there's not a whole lot of change in the 2000 to 6000 meter that we, th we think. Um, the 700 to 2000 meter is quite variable, but um, before Argo, there were not a whole lot of measurements below 700 meters. Everyone thought that most of the interesting changes would be happening above that, um, or at least the changes that might affect the weather, things like that. Um, so ocean heat content and deeper ocean is a more recent discovery. So the 700 to 2000 meter change is actually a pretty substantial contribution um, beyond the 700 meter change. We think the abyssal ocean change is smaller, but it's very hard to estimate and we don't really have good measurements of it. Okay, so all this warming is giving us what's called the thermosteric sea level. So now these are estimates of the thermosteric sea level, which are either de which have been detrended in a way that is complicated to explain. But anyway, here they are. Um, uh, oh, this is totally detrended. So this is just the anomaly from uh, a linear uh, progression over 93 to 2015, so that you can see that there is some pretty substantial variability in millimeters around this overall trend. But without any detrending, you can see that there's about a 30 millimeter contribution over this time window from the zero to 700 meter. There's a maybe five, six millimeter um, contribution from the 700 to 2000, and very little, maybe one millimeter from the greater than 2000 meter uh, based on this estimate. So this is only the thermosteric sea level change. It's not the halosteric female sea level change. Okay, Aviso CNES. Okay, so this is now putting together a lot of different estimates during the satellite era of how much global mean sea level change there is. So this is now back to the total global mean sea level. But this is, uh, again, the same kind of thing where you've superimposed a lot of different satellite estimates on top of each other to try and get at what the variability about the end is. Once we have satellites, satellite altimeters, this is a, this doesn't matter nearly as much as we did on the kind of traditional thermosteric sea level measurements, which were all over the place. So either by Argo, that is the end of this of this thermosteric sea level picture, or by satellites, we have a pretty clean uh, measurement of those contributions to the overall. And so uh, this is getting more detail than we need to talk about right now. So of those different budgets that we have, here are some here are some of the ways of thinking about pieces of that story. So the global mean sea level as a function of time is a combination of the steric plus the added ocean mass. This is the land water contribution and the melting ice sheet contribution. Um, this set of combinations down here is from the uh, breaking it down further into an ocean part, glaciers, Greenland, and Antarctica. So the ice pieces and snow ice pieces. Um, and then uh, water vapor and terrestrial water storage, um, some uncertainty was there. So this is a different budget that you might consider closing. So these two pieces of the story are interesting to make different contributions to. 
So do these two different modes of estimation agree? If we take the altimeter that is looking from the satellites and we take the thermosteric and then we take the contributions of land water into the ocean, which we can determine from gravity recovery satellite, the GRACE mission, we put those three together, do they all add up to the same thing? And this is a beautiful example that, that it, it does occur. So here, the thermosteric, the Argo is shown in red, the ocean mass estimate is shown in green, and then adding those two together gives you the, uh, the dashed black line, and the direct measure of sea surface height from altimetry is the blue line. So essentially the fact that these add up is telling us that there's nothing missing in our present monitoring system that is uh, contributing anything to global mean sea level, at least over this post Argo time series. So now we are fully measuring everything that needs to be measured from 2005 on in order to do those global mean budgets. If we, if we don't use the gravity uh, measurements to get at what's going on with this, with the changes to land ice and land water, um, we can go and measure the ice sheets directly themselves, measure the land water themselves, and you get these kind of con contributors where everybody's getting broken down. There's still a lot of disagreement between different methods of how to measure the different ice sheet inputs. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, uh, of, issues with how to measure the land water storage. Um, we don't even know how many ponds there are in the world, for example, and we certainly don't track all the aqueous water and, and all the water in aquifers. But um, the measuring it in gravity, of course, gets in, takes into account all of those, but in a relatively imprecise way, just kind of large scale variations in that water, but not so much um, the detailed location by location uh, sources of that water. Um, so the there's an enormous series of efforts to try and close these budgets. Um, they are now pretty well closed. Um, this uh, is something you can go and read this paper and buy lots of other papers about this. Um, this is a huge part of a huge effort to try and get all of these budgets closed in different ways to ensure the consistency of our uh, measurements. So like I said in the beginning, the pure physics tells us what the combinations have to be, A plus B plus C plus D equals zero, but we are measuring A and B and C and D and with very different instrument arrays and with very different sampling patterns. So checking that those budgets close essentially is a double check on the accuracy of all those measurements, the sampling of all those measurements, the uncertainty ranges we have for all those measurements. So closing the budgets over and over and over again is telling us essentially that we're not missing anything in our estimation of each of the different contributing terms. So here's another example of sea level rise as, as observed versus the thermal expansion and the grace. And um, then the residual are the little green dots. The residual is how much mismatch we have. And basically you don't want the residual to be very large. This is showing us year by year by year from the sea level budget paper that I just showed. And I'm not even sure why I decided to show you this one. I'll skip it. Okay. Um, when we try and measure the changes of the ice sheets themselves, so Greenland on the left, Antarctica on the right, you can see that there's different contributions from different places. So you can imagine how hard it would be to go and measure all of this entire continent scale ice sheet um, in, in either of these extremely difficult to access locations to the level of precision that's needed. So. These are the mass changes from the GRACE satellite, and you can see that it's relatively coarse resolution. And in, in terms of GRACE, we know that the total mass adds up to be what it is, but um, the, if we chop these uh, continental uh, ice sheets down into their different basins, uh, that is where if the ice sheet were to melt, where it would drain, and the drainage basins are all over, there are many, many, many small regions and so linking that to observations on top of the ice sheet about how where the melt is occurring, how much snow is happening, getting all of the variability in those terms ready to make sure that the um, 
input output method, which is that regional observation versus the gravity method all lines up is an amazing uh, technical accomplishment as well. Even though it's not the whole story of the sea level budget, it's a big part of the story. So here's another example of why it's hard. This is tr uh, comparing those different sea level contributions from different estimates over Antarctica and over Greenland. You can see there's year to year variability. There's uh, obviously these are inaccessible places. There, these bands don't necessarily agree, particularly in Antarctica, which is not as well measured as Greenland. Um, this is a, a very hard thing to do. Um, what are the dynamics? Um, why it's really hard to do this. So this is just showing you some of the contributing terms. So you need to measure the snowfall. And so the green here is for Greenland and the blue is for Antarctica. So you need to measure the snowfall, you need to measure the rainfall, you need to measure the meltwater, you need to measure the evaporation and sublimation. You need to measure the melting and refreezing at the, at the bottom of the ice shelf. You need to measure, which is normally parameterized based on the um, ocean temperature changes. Yeah, there's icebergs and sea ice coming off. There's land ice flow coming out. There are these crevasses that are forming. To get all of these pieces in place and add up what the um, how much flow there is over the grounding line, that is how much uh, previously land bound mass, land supported mass is becoming ocean supported mass, and so therefore le le leading to sea level change. Um, involves closing all these, adding all these pieces together and coming up with something. These are very big numbers. They have pretty big uncertainties. There are a lot of different contributors. Some of these contributors are maybe easier to estimate or measure, but they might be small contributors. Um, lots of these are very difficult to measure. In addition, one of the things, particularly when we're thinking about projecting into the future, although to some extent, um, these processes have been or could be observed or if they're undergoing. The outlets in Antarctica are vulnerable to something called the marine ice sheet instability. If they lie on bedrock that lies below the sea level and slopes downward toward the inland, that is here, if the grounding line like this, that's an un potentially unstable. Um, uh, and another one that's the marine ice sheet instability and then the marine ice cliff instability, if there are unstable ice cliffs with heights above 90 meters. So now we're talking about this part, ice cliffs upward and downward, these two different instability mechanisms um, can greatly accelerate the rate of loss. So both of these processes are very poorly represented in uh, models at the moment or poorly understood in models. Sometimes they are represented, but we don't really know how to model them very effectively. It's a cascading range of scales between the small scale and the large scale. Um, the small scale dynamics where the solid mechanics of the ice sheet itself operate versus the large scale bu budgets that would uh, be subject to these kind of instability mechanisms. Um, and so the problem, this makes a problem in that our ice sheet models may be representing these processes or may not be representing these processes or partially representing these processes. And this has a huge impact on not so much the total mass of ice sheet that potentially could melt, but the rate at which it might melt at different temperatures. And that's different atmospheric temperatures and different ocean temperatures. And so all of this stuff contributes together to a pretty deep uncertainty about the ice sheet contributions. Here's one way of thinking about the ice sheet contributions and the glacier contributions. Um, this is over many thousands of years, or over 2000 of years. Um, if you take the temperature in a model, warm it up and then uh, hold it there, um, we do a pretty decent job of predicting the, uh, we think it's fairly easy to predict the thermosteric sea level, which is the upper, upper part of this uh, uh, figure. The next part of the figure is the uh, glacier contributions, mountain glaciers, not ice sheets. 
And then we have Greenland in this next row, and then we have Antarctica in the bottom row. We add all this together, and we get um, a pretty interesting set of uh, projections from this. And one of the most important things is that it looks like there's a threshold in Greenland somewhere between one degree and two degrees of warming above uh, present or above pre-industrial conditions. This is one of the main reasons why we're trying to keep global warming below one and a half degrees is to try and avoid crossing this threshold. If we cross this threshold, it means that one day sea level will be six meters or more higher because Greenland will have passed a threshold at which point we don't easily get it back. Um, and so obviously six meters of sea level is a big problem. Six meters of sea level is if you just think about places in Rhode Island that are within six meters of sea level, you can get a, a sense of the problems here. If you think about the global scope, places like Florida, Bangladesh, the Seychelles, Mauritius, lots of these places have very, you know, entire countries may be lost with six meters of sea level or become uninhabitable with six meters of sea level rise. So even though this could be thousands of years in the future, um, we, it's something we would like to avoid. There does not seem to be as clear of a, of a transition point in Antarctica and some kind of break point, at least in this modeling study. Um, but those instability mechanisms that I just described are exactly the kinds of things that would be a, a, a problem. And you also can see that there doesn't appear to be any threshold behavior in the kind of 2000 year forecast versus the many thousands of year forecast. So maybe this isn't something we have to worry about because 2000 years is a long time. I don't know. This is where it gets very complicated to think about what the impacts of climate change when they are multi-millennial, multi changes in hand. Um, this is just another, bre another breakdown of the observed trends in the budget. Um, this one is uh, you know, giving you a sense of the thermostatic glaciers, Greenland, Antarctica, uh, terrestrial water storage and how big those numbers are. This is a graphical representation of essentially that same data. Here's the sum and here are the different contributors and you can look under different projections looking into the future um, under, this is a, an old school uh, definition, but these RCP 2.6, 4.5, 6.8, 8.5 are basically different emissions levels um, and you can see that the thermal expansion goes up as the different, um, as more greenhouse gases are released um, or more net radiative effect is, is included. Um, and you can see that the other changes also get bigger, but sometimes what gets bigger is the uncertainty more than the, uh, than the value. So for Antarctica, it's not clear what's going on with it. It's uncertainty increases more than its mean um, for Greenland, both the uncertainty and the mean go up as you go to the war higher warming. Um, and uh, for glaciers, the, just the contribution goes up. And for thermal, mostly the contribution goes up. OK, so well, this is now we're looking at um, this is just a different way of breaking down the thermosteric sea level. So we broke down the energy contributions of the different layers, and this is now looking at the thermosteric contributions over different layers. So most of the most of it is coming from the zero to two thousand. Um, even a good fraction of it is coming from the zero to seven hundred. The the uh, below uh, the zero to two thousand meters is is hardly distinguishable from the full depth, at least based on the limited observations we have of full depth. Now you might say, well, where is this warming occurring in terms of our oceanography center? Not surprisingly, it's happening where the water masses are getting formed. So the North Atlantic deep water is forming and warming up. The Antarctic bottom water is forming and warming up. The uh, overturning cells, uh, the subtropical cell and the Antarctic uh, uh, intermediate water pathways are all changing. Um, the heating is, uh, not exactly uniform, but approximately uniform over the over the world. And so all of these different water types based on their different ages, how long it was since they formed are pa passing warmer and warmer versions of themselves down. Secondarily, you might wonder about whether the circulation patterns were changing in addition. There's a complicated uh, breakdown of the two parts of that 
Um, there's a really interesting paper trying to decide whether the changes to circulation or the changes to the uh, so-called added heat holding the circulation fixed, how to think about that um, by uh, Bronsevier and Zana, um, a recent paper from last year that's a very interesting way of thinking about that. Um, the solid earth response is a whole other thing with, that we need to understand if we want to get regional sea level right. Um, this left-hand side is showing the um, what happens if you melt Greenland and the West Antarctic ice sheet at, at a given rate. And it looks interesting that you have, uh, you actually have negative sea level change, um, not rise, loss nearby those changes, and then positive far away. That's in fact what we expect to see in this, uh, in, in this kind of a, a, a problem because the geoid is changing along with the solid earth is changing along with the sea level and right now the ice sheets actually affect the gravitational field pretty strongly and draw the sea level toward them nearby but when those ice sheets melt they actually will release that which changes not only the amount of water in the ocean but it changes the relationship it changes the the geoid pretty substantially which means that you can have to combine those effects when you're nearby the ice sheets um, and then this on the right hand side is the glacial isostatic adjustment trend, which is basically showing you the continuing rebound of the solid earth from the removal of the weight of the um, of the Laurent of the ice sheets that are no longer there, like the Fenescandio and the Laurentide ice sheets from the from the uh, last ice age. Um, so in those regions, you have both positive and negative changes as the solid earth is, you know, still slowly rebounding from the, from that part. Um, so here's a different bit version, uh, more comparable version. This is what the glacial isostatic adjustment pattern is like, centered on the locations where the ice sheets were much bigger. Um, and during the last glacial maximum, the glacier pattern is um, interestingly non-uniform, which has a lot to do with the location of the glaciers their rates of melt around the earth. And then the ice sheet pattern um, from Greenland and West Antarctic has this two pole pattern where you have the negative values right near where, but due to the gravitational effect and then positive values pretty much everywhere else. Um, no, I'm not going to get into all of the uh, astrodynamics or planetary dynamics that has to do with all of these pieces. But there are a lot of great complications due to the fact that the Earth is not actually a sphere. It's an not even an ellipsoid. It has all of these. Uh, so keeping track of all these different variations of what we mean by sea level and which is the mean sea level and which is the geoid and all of that and the dynamics and all those pieces is very complicated, more complicated maybe than it needs to be, which has to do with those series of budgets that we were thinking about closing. But for different purposes, you might want to examine different uh, budgets in one way or another. Okay, um, but this has regional consequences when we break it down. Um, and this is just showing that sea level rise in these different cities is extremely different in both mean and variability um, as compared to the global mean, which I think is shown in red here. So some places are not really seeing much like uh, Antofagasta is not really uh, showing much of a much of a rise, whereas Manila is showing a much greater rise than normal um, due to this regional pattern of change um, that you can see in, in nearby. Um, some places in, are, in see a lot of any variability, particularly around the Southern Ocean. Some places see um, uh, you know uh, see lots of other basin related stuff like Stockholm is showing really interesting confusing patterns because it's not uh, uh, it's not out on the op open ocean but um, lots to think about all kinds of dynamics involved in this extremely hard to predict um, effectively um, if we go back to the paleo time scale you can use um, sedimentary records of the changes in salt marshes together with tide gauges to try and get a longer history of what's going on. And this basically tells you that the recent changes are a, an anomaly with as far back as we can go. Um, probably an anomaly in terms of rate of sea level at least 3,000 years before present. Um, so that's a big, 
that's a pretty big deal. And if you do take these paleo proxy, uh, paleo proxy and time gauge records and put them on top of each other, they agree pretty well with the altimetry. Maybe that's not such a, maybe that's not so crazy because of course they were all designed at the same time. So, but nonetheless, there's consistency as we go back with those different methods. And of course, when we think about the variability, we're, we've already been talking about things like El Nino, having big sea surface height variability, eddies have big sea surface height variability. So on a seasonal to interannual time scale, all of that sea surface height variability that has to do with ocean dynamics means that if you're in a particular place, say Hawaii, look how crazy the eddy field is around Hawaii. So you're obviously going to have a lot of variability in sea level that has nothing to do with global warming, but also global warming superimposed on top of that. So there's lots of dynamics. The El Nino dynamics are very difficult to uh, diagnose from all of these historical records. Um, ben Hamlington uh, um, and has been working on this for a while, together with Bob Laban, lots of others. This is uh, one paper that should be handling the time with a T. Um, uh, I've been working on this for a long time. Um, this is a nice example of uh, splitting out, trying to identify these patterns and remove them from the global, from the large scale sea level so that you don't have El Nino tangled up together with sea level changes. And if you do that, you get uh, basically pretty big changes to what you think the reconstructed sea level change was. Okay, the last topic I want to close on is what about storms and surges and tides and waves? Well, of course, you might think that you know, storms and surges would just be added on top of sea level change. That, to a first approximation, is probably not a crazy idea. And really, you know, it is those waves and surges that cause the flooding um, most immediately during a particular event. So mean sea level might be rising slowly, and it makes but it makes the highest level that those storms and surges get to just a little bit higher, slowly at a time. Um, but also climate change is changing the likelihood of storms and the likelihood of big waves. So this is a paper um, from Mark Hamer and company from 2013 that's basically showing that you get a change in sea surface, significant wave height, just basically the height of the big waves, um, of somewhere between, you know, in many parts of the world, it's uh, up to 5% of the wave height is changing. So this is the open ocean contribution, which isn't directly related to the wave effects that you get on shore, but it's, it's not too far away from that. So we're thinking about percentage changes in terms of the waves themselves. So if you were in a place like here, um, where look, the, uh, the wave height is dropping by five or 10% um, offshore because of changes to the atmospheric circulation. Um, maybe that helps compensate a bit for the mean sea level rise and that the, the combined impact of the two might not be quite as severe. So um, when you're trying to get down to the extreme water level, the thing that is the, the thing that actually floods, erodes, changes, makes places near shore inhospitable, it's a combination of all these different effects. Um, I'm not going to discuss about the whether storms are increasing or getting stronger or getting weaker, but basically um, warmer air has a tendency to accelerate the uh, hydrological cycle, which then gives storms more power you would imagine that it would scale up. Whether or not we detect that in different parts of the world is a very difficult signal to noise ratio problem. And relatedly, if you're changing the storms, you're also probably changing the hydrology and the precipitation on land and all of that adds up to something, which is the terrestrial water storage anomaly question. And this is one estimate of the terrestrial water storage. You can see there's an awful lot of variability. This is millimeters equivalent of sea level lots of year to year variability, annual cycle variability. Um, if you try and smooth that out, um, you get, uh, uh, you know, you, you do still see a trend, but the trend is relatively small compared to the year to year variability. Um, and here's, you know, El Nino, 
not only is this climate change related change in the hydrological cycle, but interannual variability, El Nino, et cetera, also changes the land water storage. Um, this is from a paper uh, um, that I was part of a while back. So when you put this all together and get down to like a place like Providence and wonder about what's important, um, you might say, well, what does mean sea level look like if we change, think about the sea level rise? And that's what the right hand side is showing. So these are places that would be under, under danger if we take uh, one, two, three, and five feet of sea level rise and just add it to the mean. It, yes, it's a problem. Surely there's some features and, you know, the bike path over here is in deep trouble, <laughs> but not, um, you know, shorelines might recede, we would probably get a change in erosion, but that's not so scary as what's on the left hand side, which is what if you have the base flooding of a 25 year event, 50 year event, 100 year event, a lot more gets flooded under those kind of events. So the question is, is whether the 50 year, 100 year, 25 year events become more frequent under climate change. So, so much so that that flooding becomes an annual level event, semi-annual level event. It's not the mean change that's important. It's the change to the extreme water that really changes the livability or habitability of these near shore regions, which is a combination of the big storms, their frequency, and the mean sea level part. All right, thanks very much.